thought we were sitting around having pizza at about six, and we thought no one's going to come out in this weather. <laughs> so well done. <laughs> 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 Welcome everybody to Open Mic Night number 22. Yep. 22. We had our 21st last month. So you missed cake if you weren't here. <laughs> Those of you who don't know me, I think I have spoken to just about everybody. My name is Blaise Van Heck. I am part of the Busy Bird team. Um, I'm sure you know who's who in the Busy Bird team. Um, I can't actually see anyone. <laughs> anyway, I think we all know each other well enough to know who's who. So welcome to Busy Bird. Um, this is our monthly open mic night. And, oh, good t-shirt. Um, <laughs> um, this is what we hope to be uh, a night where people can come and read their stuff without feeling judged and... Uh, it, it help improve their writing or songwriting or poetry, whatever they're doing. Um, and, you know, it's a bit of fun. Even if you're not a writer, it's nice to listen to people's stuff. So, we actually have a nice big list of readers tonight. So, we're <coughs> going to limit the time to four minutes. Les is our timekeeper up the back and he has a little bell, but he will ring when time is up. You don't have to stop immediately, you can finish um, the sentence or paragraph or whatever, but it's just so that we aren't here till midnight. <laughs> as much as I love you guys, I like to go home to my flannel sheets. <laughs> yeah. Flannel sheets are the best invention ever. Right. That is new name, is it? Yeah, that was... Sorry? Is that his new name? <laughs> Who is that man? <laughs> Mr. Flannel. So, I'm actually, um, I'm going to actually stay with the, the order that people have written their names down because it actually pans out quite well and has been a mixture of poems and stories. <coughs> so, I'm going to start with Ian. Ian's going to read um, some of his story that is in our prostate cancer book called Below the Belt. Now, Ian comes from a long way. Is it Karen Downs? Karen. Yeah, comes from Karen, so he's very dedicated. So, welcome, Ian. Uh, I'm one of the 35 contributors to the book, and my chapter is called Jousting with Authority by Ian McCartney. Associate Professor Dick Van Murphy, who counts that before 1990, was offered a depressing future for men with prostate cancer patients until the PSA blood test became available. Most prostate cancers were diagnosed at an advanced stage, and these cancers were incurable with a five year survival rate less than 60%. To add to the patient's misery, the main treatment was simply castration. This entails simply cutting off the man's testicles and thus stopping the testosterone supply which stimulated the prostate cancer growth. This was not really a cure but only a temporary relief measure before an eventual painful death from metastatic bone cancer with a fairly ordinary quality of life in the meantime. Time in the real world, the triple whammy of castration, radiation, and advanced age pegs one back to somewhere near zero. Erectile, uh, the incidence of erectile dysfunction tends to be underestimated by the medical profession, but patients tell a different story. Um, I was diagnosed with prostate cancer in 1999. A urologist's very brief summary of possible treatments went as follows. Radiation is no good to you because it has got into your bones. He then proposed organectomy castration, saying chemical treatment will have the same effect on impotency and has cardiac risks. Now I have a long, lifelong weakness for complying with those in authority, 
be it my mother, my teacher, my NCO, or my doctor. <laughs> so I reluctantly agreed with his recommendation. Good. Oh. <laughs> 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 right, to say a little bit more, I, uh, I later took it to the uh, made a complaint to the Medical Practitioners Board and after three years and two appeals I got an adverse finding against my surgeon and surgeon, my dear old surgeon, <laughs> uh, so which made me feel a bit better. <laughs> Good thing. I'm sure a few of the men in the room were <laughs> Thank you, Ian. Crystal. Where's Crystal? Crystal, come on up here and read some of your poetry. <laughs> this is a piece called Sapling. This woman says she never has a bad thing to say about anyone. She calls herself worthless. Her name ornaments the red lights of her daughter's lips, but for some women, the names we give ourselves stick firmer than salted taffy. Her daughter lines soft white lilies high on the mantle where the cat cannot reach. The woman likes it this way. She smiles at her daughter, shakes her head and wonders in silence from where the sapling inherits its poison. I am trying to find a way back to you tonight. I will travel any way I can, on a puff of smoke, through neon-lit matchstick landscapes or down the golden river by raft and broken oak oar. The taxi driver presses like a child at my chest. He says the ride is free if I let him taste my lips. I don't tell him they still taste like yours. Thanks, Crystal. Well, I'm glad there was at least two this month. Last week, Crystal only read one, made, leaving us wanting more. So, thank you. Marcello, poems? Come on up. Yes. Yeah. No, no, you do. Um, I love flowers. My wife looks after them. Of course, I look after the veggie patch, and because I'm in the thirty-five roses, of all kinds, and about forty camellias and so forth. Last week, we had a beautiful sort of crop of bright red roses. It's, I know it's winter, and normally this is a time of camellias, but these were roses. So that ruined my week. <laughs> Simple as that. So I was done. So I wrote one little poem, then another, and then I, I thought I'd combine almost, not quite, into a third one. So I decided what to do with it eventually. If I could, if I could live a real love, I want it full of colours, intense like a golden dream, of fields of wheat and singing crickets, in between red poppies and summer cicadas, to contemplate the blue sky in the light breeze of a torrid sun. Flight. In a flight of swallows, my most beautiful poem. I love losing myself in your eyes. I love losing myself in your smile, in the simplicity of things that happen. Pick me if you want, and I shall be the first rose of the morning that blooms for you. My love, my red rose. I love reds in my paintings, okay? It's worse for me there would be only one color red. Come in my flower garden and share with me the joy of its perfume. The colours are stunning like my old palette. 
it never ages and it will be young forever. Like I shall remain youthful for you. I will always be there for you to share the beauty of my flowers. If you want, you will be the first red roses covered in cool perfumed dew that I shall pick in the morning. And you shall bloom only for me. Every morning we'll pick a fresh flower that reminds me of you. My real morning red rose. <laughs> on Monday night, uh, this is ex officio. Uh, on, on Monday night, the uh, and Paul was there too, actually. We had the, the annual general meeting of Multicultural Arts Victoria, been on board member for many, many years. Now to have an extension for another 12 months for a big project. But uh, we had as a guest the Minister well, for Creative Industries of the Arts and five other portfolios. He's got health or whatever, mental health, you name it. He's got a book that you feel comfortable with. So that's it. And so I, I think that we all should say thank you to the team here for what they do for us. It's not easy. The wider for us on this wet night, and I thought we were going to have a, a poker game on one side. But the, <laughs> and, and also the way somebody said, "Oh, Marcella, I just saw in the net that your book is on the in the national in the national library archives, and uh, in the triple I." Citation in uh, Harvard, citation, whatever that is, in four or five different places. So, I, I, you know, when you think we are, and you know, we, most of the people know what I feel about this, and, and that reinforced what I've been thinking all along. So, <laughs> is going to be a voucher that you can choose, which will be uh, workshops, um, either writing or photography. So have a think about what you prefer. <laughs> have to win first. <laughs> <laughs> <I'm high. laughs> um, I wanted to just let people know, you may, you may have seen it in our newsletter, but we're going to be publishing this book next month. Went to the printers today. We've been working on this book for a year. Uh, it's the autobiography of Joffa. Now, some people may not, or well, a lot of people may not know who Joffa is. I didn't know it until I decided I was going to publish a book. <laughs> um, no, he, the boys were talking about him, to, something to do with football, so I wasn't taking any notice anyway. <laughs> anyway, he is actually a very interesting man, and he has a very interesting story. He was living on the streets, um, he does a lot of charity work. And we're actually really excited about how this has come together. We've got Father Bob McGuire to launch it. Uh, we're launching at the Valley Union Bar only because we don't think we're going to be able to fit everyone here. Uh, so it is an open invitation to anyone who has anything to do with Busy Bird. But if you want to come, you need to have your name on the list because uh, it's going to be limited numbers. So um, if you want to know more, if you haven't seen it in the newsletter, let me know. And we, Les and Les, Les and Joffa were on the radio this afternoon on Penny Valley FM about that, and they did really well. Pam, and we've got two Pams, not Pamela, but Pam. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, would you like to come up and read your poem, Aging Love? Yeah. Yes. Um, I've had no experience whatsoever in reading in front of a lot of people, so um, just bear with me. Um, I've written a poem called Aging Love because we seem to be such a youth-centred world that I think people don't realise that old people or older people can still be very much in love um, just as much as they were when they were young. And um, I've noticed that more as I've got older. And it starts off with, I don't care if you have less hair, that wrinkled smile is still there. Wisdom and understanding comes with age, characteristics that make me love you at this aging stage. 
hands with skin, paper thin, gnarled knuckles and protruding veins. Only they know how they've toiled over the years, labouring, nurturing and allaying many fears. What tales they could tell if they could speak, but the evidence is there that you are not weak. I'm not fooled by your eyes that are now pale and glazed, as they harbour the truth and that it is just a phase. The lovers we were when we were young are different from the lovers we have now become. It is our inner selves that we now explore, more rewarding and revealing than you can <laughs> Read them all out. Yeah, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> Marcel enjoys red. I enjoy another colour. <laughs> This is called impatience. As a mother with a teething babe keeps watch on tender gum, her anxious eye detects each phase, awaits each pearl to come. No less the stress is mine each day when down the path I toil stop and anxiously seek signs of life beneath the soil. What does it cost a tiny bulb to quicken and disturb? A sight unseen, unheard above, what miracles occur to pierce the load of earth and finally break through? How many weeks or months will pass before a green shoot makes its thrust and struggles into view? A miser's count I daily keep, while sun's warm rays my treasures steep, and sturdy shafts press earth apart, strive up and up each day, in tall and straight green spears divide. Not yet the grand display, they hide a secret deep inside. From cradled arms soon will emerge a sheath, which stretches, plumps, and grows till life within, with one great surge breaks through. And on a frosty morn, a trump of golden glory shines. A daffodil is born. <laughs> I don't know whether I can read this very well <clears throat> because I think last time I had trouble with my teeth. <laughs> I have written a few book, a few poems for children, so bear with me that this is really for children. I've called it Stay at Home Day. It's do bad when you've had to stay at home and lie in bed because you ache all over and you're stumped up in the head. <laughs> it's too bad when you've lots of books and lots of time as well, and you can't be bothered reading, and your dose has lost its spell <laughs> for food. The only stuff you have is horrid tasting mixture and 27 big white pills which they insist will fix you. <laughs> this one's called The Cavern. The cavern gapes grotesquely. On either side within, fierce and rigid, an ivory guard. From darkened depths and anger, <laughs> Thanks, Jane. I'm sure everyone knows about the recent earth 
quake in Nepal, or the quakes, you know, one wasn't enough, was it? <laughs> so we had a bit of a um, time between exhibitions, between Marcello's and the next one. So Ken has put his pictures back up, and any of them that we sell is going to go straight to the earthquake um, appeal. So if you'd like to buy one, or if you know someone who would like to buy them, send them in, that would be great. And I forgot to mention at the start that Kev is um, videoing this for everyone's readings and we put it up on YouTube. If you don't want to be on YouTube, please let us know so that we can cut you out. Um, obviously, if you're moving from either side of here, you won't get on, on it either because the camera's set up. Okay, Paul. Paul has been gallivanting all over Thanks, boys. Well, it was a pleasure and a disappointment on Monday night. The pleasure of seeing uh, Marcello being honoured by his peers. The disappointment was he didn't read any of his poetry. Uh, I'm currently writing uh, a verse memoir, I guess, partly prose, partly verse. And uh, tonight I'll be reading a free verse narrative from that larger work. Uh, the larger work is called In Conversation with My Grandfather. This particular piece is called The Boxers. The Boxers, Fitzroy Collingwood Police Club, 2nd of February, <clears throat> 1932. Stale sweat permeated the air in the very fabric of the large gloomy space. One that had never seen a woman's touch or heard a woman's voice. No place here for beauty or gentleness. The canvas marked by countless boot scuffs, deeper stains at opposite corners, where sat small wooden stools, dried blood, sp spittle, sweat and dreams, all mixing to colour the fighter's ring. You know the rules, the referee had toned. Fight clean, touch your gloves, three rounds of que Queensbury rules. Return to your corners and come out fighting. Close on 60 men standing, sitting, leaning on equipment, air heavy with smoky anticipation, as the word had got out, the Donnell twins are boxing tonight. Gloves pop profit and touched, staring into each other's eyes, as way to the other a deep red, not for Larry decoration. All part of the pugilistic theatre to provide some difference for the referee to count the blows, Eddie sported red, Nicky in the blue. Eyes locked to each other's gaze, slightest movement anticipated, counted, the dance goes on. Left jab, spitting, loaded, blurred, blurred, rapid. All met with blood resistance or deftly avoided. Jab, faint, evade, left jab, right cross, left uppercut. Combination after combination avoided, protectively absorbed. Boxers, not fighters. Skillful combatants, not barroom brawlers. Circle, step in, fade back. Never a cry of hitting from the crowd. They are mesmerised by two handsome men, unmarked, unbloodied, unbowed. Three rounds of lightning movement, grace, poise and skill, a masterclass in the art of boxing. Come back next month, the twins may be at it again. Are there really two in there? Seems to me like one bloke boxing his shadow, one wag was heard to say. Yes, uh, this is, I would like to get through to the end of this story um, because um, it's, uh, it's not. <laughs> In England, uh, we still live World War II and almost every weekend there are several World War II events on uh, all over the country. Uh, and this particular one, this is a true story, and it's on the Watercrest Line, which is a, a privately uh, preserved railway and attracts thousands of people. And it also attracts a lot of reenactors. <coughs> so you get uh, Churchill's, men dressed as Churchill, very good as well, Bob Gromery, Aussie soldiers, uh, American soldiers, 
And it also attracts a number of veterans, uh, actual soldiers who go along there. And it's based, as I say, it's a real story, based on this little man who I saw every year, and I call him um, Old Soldier. Uh, it's the second part, at the very beginning, Old Soldier arrives there, the station is packed, and he stumbles, and a girl dressed as a, um, a land girl with a cheeky little uh, lad at her side catches Old Soldier. Anyway, on we go. The announcer is on the tannoy again. The train due any minutes is the 10.30 from Aylesford. That moment, Viv the Spiv walks past. Hello, Old Soldier. Hello, Viv. Viv looks great. He always takes a pride in his attire. Told me at a raunchy angle. Flowery tie, sharp suit, polished shoes, patent leather. Yes, Viv looks the part. And here's Montgomery, followed by Churchill, waving to the crowd. Several gather round for an autograph. Outside a station, a car backfires. Harold ducks instinctively. Harold's the old soldier. You're right, says the woman. You've gone quite pale, old soldier. The kid laughs. Oh, I, didn't, I, I thought you said you were a brave soldier. I didn't say I was brave, replies Harold. Just a soldier. Maury re reenactors pass and the train pulls into the station. Then there's a fly pass with a Lancaster Spitfire, Spitfire and Hurricane. It's a great day out. But the spear entertains the passengers as they mill around the platform. There's a tea shop and a lady selling bread and dripping, and Richard Holmes is the author, selling his evacuee book. Viv the Spear flashes a smile at the girls, gold fillings glinting in the sunlight. Get your nile on to your ladies, no coat bonds needed. He opens his double-breasted jacket and they hang from his inside his pocket. He pulls his sleeve up and his arm is fist too with watches. Fell off the back of a truck, didn't they? There's a group of Americans with General Eisenhower leading the way. Viv greets him like a long lost brother. Fancy a watch, General? Tears the right time, twice a day, every day. You can count on it. General Eisenhower glad, glad hands Viv. You're a great guy, but I'll give you watch as a mess if you don't mind. It's a good American accent delivered with a Hampshire twang. Here's a taxi driver when he's not the General. A man in civvies pushes his way out of the throng, seeming to recognise Harold. It's Harold Shatter's book, isn't it? He asks. In the Royal Sussex, Italy 44, you remember? Harold looks uncertain. There's a certain something familiar about him, something from the past that touches a nerve. The sound of the guns and shells. Yes, the sun for shells landing near. Too dear. He feels dizziness, dizziness coming on again. The man is still talking through the haze. Tommy Sober, you remember me, mate. Your old mate, Monty Casino. That bloody battle. You caught it, but not before you did what you did. Harold doesn't know what he did before he did. The dizzy spells get in the way of his memory. He is happy with that, and a day at the watercress line. You have to count your blessings when you're Harold Shatterspot on the wrong side of 80. Harold stumbles again. This time the, the lamb girl can't catch him. You all right, she says. You all right, old soldier. Can you hear me? Can you hear? Mm. novels and this is just a bit of an extract from one of them. It's called The Clarity of Cause. <laughs> the callous wind bombarded the oaken door to the Three Stones Tavern, whispering and rattling as it reminded those within of what remained outside. Ramblings of the drunk and homeless filled the air with a false sense of hope, suggesting that what is to come will not. Glass jugs of beer and cider resting upon the trays of the young and beautiful shook and rang in a choir of anxiety, 
their hope not lying in the arms of ignorance. Perhaps it was this pity, or perhaps it was their youth. Perhaps it was even their misled dedication, but it was these waiters and waitresses who were left to remain completely sober and aware to feel the true force of the calamitous tempest waiting patiently outside only metres away. Those who remained fully conscious trembled as much as the poorly lit lanterns hanging from the roof above. They swung as they screeched, trying as best they could to break free of their iron chains. Their screams were muted by the customers below, dancing and singing like it was their last night in this world, for it might as well be. But all of this went unbeknownst to Athelos. The shrouded figure sat in the far corner of the tavern, alone within himself. His stare was distant as he remained an image of melancholy. He barely took notice as, the, as yet another brimming jug joined his smiling collection, his mind now as clouded with drink as it was with inevitability. Although his facade was a calm mask, his heart was somewhat perturbed. Answers and solutions danced wildly on the table before him, mocking Athos with their knowledge, only to retreat and tease again just before he could grasp them. The bell atop the tavern door rang, indicating another penurious soul seeking refuge. This soul, however, would find no such glass and nothing else. He had heard the warning bell as the door opened, yet his hand only stretched out to calmly stroke his coarse, black stubble. A leather hood hid his face from the world, his skin and his other features only becoming visible as he exhaled down through a wooden pipe, evoking the embers to life. This only exacerbated the air around him with a foul stench, something that had become familiar in recent weeks. At this stage, other men and women in the tavern could not she, she did not need such self, however. These people were so far drowned in denial that her movements would not even offer them much needed breath if promised with reality. If we are to speak, then sit. Athos's rough voice spoke. His gaze was held fast on his foaming glass. If you were as good as steel as you are with drink, you would not have to meet in such a lonely place, Athos. Thea said as she began to withdraw the hood. This revealed a freshly shaven scalp where long and beautiful black hair used to reside. What happened to you? Athos asked, showing a little sympathy. The green grey jewels they had for eyes flinched and her fragile brown skin stiffened. Though most of her hair had been taken, she was still a sight to be marvelled at. Some people it's really hard to get up in front of people, so I'm really impressed with everybody's reading. Pamela is going to read some of her memoir. First kiss. <laughs> <laughs> I was 18 at the time. Yeah, yeah. I've <laughs> 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 Telling you about journeys and the sewing in London, where I stayed, and I finished with the, the windmill, uh, dancing with the windmill, and then I got a contract with Bottom of Regis for buttons again. But I had six weeks, and I didn't want to go home, so I tried to find an ordinary job. So I went into a, a sandwich bar, got a job for two, two hours. When I told them off the dance, they threw me out. Then I got a job at a cinema for three days. The noise was crazy, and I, I couldn't stand it. Then I got a job in, in, in a, as a waitress, and that worked. Except that the waiter there was trying to ask me out, and I hated him. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll take it up for there. <laughs> I'm not looking forward to this kiss now. <laughs> I'm scared about the little bells. <laughs> I'll leave that up. Okay, here we go. It was a glorious sunny afternoon. The park a kaleidoscope of colours. People everywhere, with children screaming as they enjoyed the Big Dipper, and other amusements, and long queues of people waiting for a ride. I was thirsty, and looked longingly at a tea stool. Suddenly, a handsome young man appeared, and looked me straight in the face. Would you like a cup of tea? Yes, I replied feebly. 
He darted into the crowd and came back swiftly with two steaming hot teas. I admired his tenacity, his cute dicky bow tie, his cheeky grin and twinkling eyes. He was about 25 years old, of medium build, and wearing a sports jacket. Grinning, he asked me, would you like to go on one of those amusements? We spent the next couple of hours getting to know each other as we queued to go on the Big Dipper. It was the start of a wonderful adventure with Simon. He owned a revved up mini minor and drove it like a racing driver. He took me out at the weekends to pubs and various other places, and up and down, oblivious to everything except each other. We stopped and he took me in his arms and whispered, I love you. Startled by this admission, I pulled away and exclaimed, Oh no, I can't. I belong to dance. He looked disappointed. He was quiet for a few moments and took me home, never mentioned me again, but insisted on, biting, on driving me to Bogner Regis. Bogner Regis is just over an hour's drive from London, a seaside town in West Sussex on the southern coast of England and boasts the maximum sunny days in an English town in summer. We took the small meandering country roads, laughing and happy as we passed through quaint little villages until we reached our destination. But we didn't go directly to the camp. As Simon took us to the beach where we ran along the bell. Just me and two. Ruth is going to read a piece called a poem, September 11, that is actually written by Pam. Come on up. Um, so welcome. short stories that I'd like to have published, that we're planning to have published. She and I are doing battle. She's a brave girl. <laughs> <laughs> but I love her and her, her comments have been so helpful. But um, because I've got nothing ready yet, I'm going to read this poem by Pamela Joy Medcalf. And it was written on February 2012. And, um, as Blaise said, it's entitled September the 11th. Such horror, such grief. Men, women and children could only weep. Two tall buildings once stood proud. In one cruel sweep, crushed to the ground. Crazed men, not fearing their fate, Innocents unable to save people from actions of hate. There would be 40 virgins waiting at heaven's door, a reward for killing thousands for whom we mourn. All done in the name of God, I believe. Why would they be given a reprieve belief? Fathers, mothers and families galore, so many lost, 4,000 or more. A loss of freedom prevailed that day. Everyone knew it would never be the same. Atrocities committed, no respect for human life. Sounds familiar, as it's nothing new, only this time seen from a different view. Eyes of the world witnessing firsthand, no propaganda, as pictures were sent to every land. America never attacked on its own soil before. The whole world waited with a bated breath. Thank you, Ruth. Gay. Gay Miller is going to read some of her poem. Are you going to maybe sing for us? See you again. You ask how I am, and 
up in question, an entree to fill the space of your embarrassment, an offering once presented regretted. How am I? I'm old. I ache and weep deeply in raw crevices of memories festering and devouring me. I long for love and affection. I want to believe you care, but I cannot. Tomorrow I will be an uncomfortable memory. Duty done, conscience clear for another year. Don't you remember me? Remember what we were to each other? The laughter, the jokes, the games. Don't you see me? How am I? I'm almost gone. This one's called My Love. Don't fear the future, my love. Just walk hand in hand with me. Head high, back straight. Together we'll walk the roads, lanes and freeways of our fates. When illness and death appear, be brave for me as I for you. When all is fraught with worry, seek strength from sources of love, from God, from friends and family. Do not dread what may not come. Be caring, dance into life. Store memories for the future, to relive and re-enjoy. Don't fear the future, my love. Hold my hand, look ahead and take one step at a time. This poem is, I've never been this heavy before. The bathroom scales have gone berserk. The ridiculous number of kilos I see couldn't possibly belong to me. I've never been that heavy before. I'll try it again just to make sure that it wasn't sitting on an uneven floor. I've taken off my clothes and things, my watch, my necklace and earrings, but the scale still says the same. I don't want to go there again. There has to be something seriously wrong. I've never been this heavy before. I'll weigh myself once more tonight before I go to bed. This nightmare of faulty readings is doing in my head. Tonight, if the silly scale readings remains the same, I'm taking them back to the shop again. Would you believe I've swapped it before? <laughs> These poor quality goods I really do deplore. And I know for sure that it's not right because I've never, never, never been this heavy before. <laughs> How much time have I got? Where is he? 20 seconds. One second, okay. <laughs> Um, should I? Do it. Okay. I'm going to try a rap. I'm not very good at this. <laughs> but I wrote this, I wrote this for my grandson when he was being bullied. Hey bully boy, watch your prop. You're trying to be nasty, you're doing a good job. Stop being nasty and try being nice and let me give you some advice. There's plenty of fun things you can do instead of bothering me all day through. Can't you be anything but a pain trying to irritate me again and again? Like a blowfly, you keep coming back, ready for another pointless attack, annoying anyone that you can find. I wonder what goes on in your mind. So wise up, bully boy, and start again. Just try being nice and make amends. Maybe one day we might even be friends. Thank you. <laughs> So <laughs> I know you feel the same, I've seen it in your eyes, but we could never be, we couldn't stand the lies. I'll never feel your lips on mine, you never hold me in your arms, so this is goodbye. We both have families that we could never leave And not for us a time of secrets and deceit So I must go away before you say how you feel So this is goodbye My tread is heavy and my tears are falling late So this is goodbye so this is goodbye. Thank you, that was a change. <laughs> Good to have you back again. We missed you. Thank you all. Come on up. <laughs>
Daniel has a short story called The Hug Check. That's it? Yay! Yeah. Yeah. Good evening, audience. Um, you'll have to bear with me, I haven't read in a long time. I haven't written as much as I would like in the last few years. But, um, I was walking home from work a couple of months ago and I had one of those fortunate moments that I think writers wish would happen more often, where I saw something that really excited me. Thank God, I've got to get this down. Um, it's very short and I think everyone knows how much contempt Les has for conjunctions and adjectives. I'm quite impartial to them, so I've got 77 of the most verbose, self-satisfying words you can hear tonight. Uh, this is called the hug shake. It occurred on a front porch in Northcote. When the door opened and the two recognised each other, one man offered his hand while the other wrapped his arms around his counterpart and embraced him. There was nothing poetic or romantic about this scene. It was not a sceptical man returning home, uncertain about how he would be received, only to be taken in with open arms. It was a wholly awkward interaction in which both men had drastically misjudged the strength of their relationship. Thank you. Oh. Please, Susie. Susie. Yeah. Come on up. Susie is going to read an extract from King's Company. I've got a very bad throat, so I hope I... Can you all hear me? Yes. yes. Excellent. Um, I'm reading, I've am i written two novels. This is from the second one. It's to do with the time traveller, Tiffany. She's gone back to 1666, England, which is a time of terrible religious intolerance. The particular scene is when Pastor John Langley is about to be executed in the local square, and she's at the back of the market, and she turns around and she goes, what the heck is happening? As she watches everybody turn around and stand in front of the, um, give it, what's the other word to give it? Oh, we'll get that. Scaffold. Scaffold, thank you. Somebody was paying attention. Give that my question. <laughs> oh, and you have to vote something. Oh, there it is. <laughs> so we start off from John Langley, the pastor. John Langley was having a surreal moment. For some reason, his legs were walking him up the steps to the scaffold. There was a sort of roaring in his ears, but everything else had shut down. He could see a blur of faces in the crowd below him. He searched for his wife, Elizabeth, wanting to see her, but praying he wouldn't. The faces moved like reflections on water. He couldn't fix on a single one. The guard who had preceded him showed him where to stand, as if there could be any doubt. The officer in charge stepped forward and banged his staff to get the crowd's attention. The priest, who had accompanied Langley from his cell, walked up the steps and stood on Langley's left, muttering a psalm. The executioner stood just behind him, fingering the heavy hemp rope. The officer was reading his says, Jump! Jump into my arms! Jump high! Langley nodded, long, long, <clears throat> Langley nodded, numbly, numbly. <laughs> Thank you, that wasn't supposed to be funny. <laughs> the executioner stood back, waiting for the moment that he would be called forward to perform his duty. On weekdays, he worked at the abattoir, only a short walk from where he now stood. Everybody who knew him knew that this was his second job. Nobody ever spoke of him. The speaker finished. The crowd hushed. Langley glanced down at the flaying knife and the bucket, ready to take his entrails. He stepped up to the podium. The hangman placed the loose around his leg, but before he had chance to remove the stool from beneath Langley's feet, Langley jumped high. The rope jerked. The loud report as his neck snapped could be heard across the square. The sigh, the clap crowd sighed, cheered, whistled, booed, hooted, clapped, anything to break the awful silence that followed the snap. Langley hung, too dead now to realise that he was being disemboweled. The executioner smiled beneath his mask. Safe in God's arms, he muttered. 
but at the back of the crowd near the well, a young woman fainted. Mm -hmm. Okay, Rebecca. Rebecca has a poem. Go <coughs> for coffee. Welcome. So this is another poem from our year in India. I guess not terribly surprisingly, I was struck by the disparity in wealth and poverty in India. And so the cities can be major international cities full of wealth. And yet the countryside, you know, like nothing had changed. Um, and we happen to live actually on the edge of Bangalore. So the city itself is prosperous, but the villages that were just there had so little money. And we had a choice between two coffee shops. So this is called going for coffee. A coffee here comes in seven different flavors in a ceramic mug, in air-conditioned comfort, in a padded chair. In prices, people over there would only dream of another life that I've never known. Step over, fall into that other world, that world of over there. Nothing is the same. Neither language, nor economy, nor worldview, nor hip pocket. A coffee there comes in in one flavour, hot and sweet, in a paper cup, in a scrap of shade, in the company of a watchful dog. In prices can't be. The divide is a mindset, a massive gulf between imagining and reality. The divide is a problem, a septic wound and oozing putrid inequality. India holds her breath, waiting. The divide is a catastrophe.